Good morning. It's so good to be with you this morning. I'm Pastor Jim Baugh with Global Training Network, and we train and equip pastors globally. Just some great news. I uh, just got back from the state of Oregon with my wife. We spent a week at Trout Creek Bible Camp with over 320 junior hires, and it was a great week. Um, over eight, 185 decisions for Christ, some first-time commitments to Christ, others recommitments of their lives to Christ. But thank you for praying. I just want to let you know that God is in the redeeming work. Uh, I just got news also from the country of Haiti where some of the individuals that I've worked with, in fact, one individual, uh, Bosner Dorr, who's involved with our discipleship training program, uh, reported to me that they went out on an outreach day and over 45 people confess faith in Christ, and so they need 45 discipleship manuals. And uh, I sent them the funds to do that as well as purchase some Bibles. Hey, if you're listening this morning and you say, I would love to be involved in supporting a ministry like that that wins people to Christ, disciples them in the faith, and continues to multiply the ministry, then I would love to speak with you. Or you can just go online to uh, www.gtn dot o-r-g forward slash ba b-a-u-g-h and you can contribute to our ministry as well as help us with discipleship materials and bibles globally in rwanda i just also got a report that they need over <clears throat> 100 new discipleship manuals in the refugee centers because they're not training three guys at a time they're training 10 15 20 people and people are coming to faith in fact it was a cool video of a Muslim woman who gave testimony of her faith coming to Christ as Savior and Lord. So all glory and praise to his name. This morning we're going to be in Psalm 23. The title of my message is The Only Shepherd Who Gives Rest. And uh, I know you know Psalm 23. It's probably found in a placard maybe in your kitchen. Uh, it's a favorite psalm of believers globally because of the, the, the truthful power of the words of Psalm 23, but we're gonna look at it in an in-depth way this morning, and I'd like you to pray with me before we do. Father, thank you for the ministry that you've called each one of us to, to win people to Christ, to disciple them in the faith, and to multiply them as they go out and tell the story. And I pray this morning as we look at Psalm 23 that you'd empower me by the Holy Spirit to lift up your Son, the Lord Jesus, and bring others to a closer walk with you. And it's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, <clears throat> Psalm 23 is a beautiful passage and it talks about rest. Um, in fact, that's the title of the message, the only shepherd who gives us rest. The idea of rest and the concept of rest is found throughout the Bible. It begins in Genesis chapter two, when God, after creation, uh, had the seventh day as a day of rest. It doesn't mean, rest does not mean just simply, you know, laying on your chase lounge with an, IT, with an iced tea. It, it means to contemplate, to trust, to, to think about, to meditate. And God didn't need a day of rest because he's God and he's greater than his creation. Isn't it beautiful to see some of the pictures of the this telescope, far-reaching pictures of the universe, and know that my God is bigger than the universe. The creator is always bigger than the creation. The creation does never, never does take precedence over the creator. And so if you think that's pretty cool, those pictures of the universe, uh, knowing God and enjoying him forever is the call for every believer. But God left us this template after creation in Genesis chapter two, and he called it the Sabaoth, or day of rest. Sabbath means rest. And it's found throughout the Old Testament. In fact, <clears throat> the book of Jeremiah, which is uh, uh, what's called a pre-exilic book. Um, Jeremiah was a prophet in Judah. He prophesied the coming of the Babylonians to discipline God's people, the Jewish people, because of their sin and to take them off into captivity. And he basically said, hey, submit to the judgment. If you try to fight this, it will be worse for you and the judgment will, will be worse for you. But Judah was so stiff-necked that they would not listen to God's prophet. And so they were, uh, Jerusalem was leveled by Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. 
about 586 BC, <clears throat> and they were taken off into captivity. But one of the reasons why they were taken off into captivity is repeated for us in the book of Jeremiah, where God tells them they did not observe rest. They did not observe Sabaoth. And it, it doesn't mean that they failed to take Saturdays off. I mean, that was part of it. But, but Sabaoth is a symbol of something deeper. Let's see if you can follow me with this. Um, uh, it's like baptism. Baptism does not wash away our sin. In fact, if you live in Arizona, you know how hard the water is. The water, yeah, water does not wash away our sin. It might wash dirt off our neck. But Christ and Christ alone, as the book of Ephesians tells us, chapter 1, we are redeemed by his blood. It's the blood of Christ that washes us the moment we put our trust in him and what he did for us on the cross. We have salvation. But what is baptism? Well, baptism is a symbol of a deeper substance, a greater meaning. And baptism doesn't wash away sin, but it does symbolize and identify us as followers of Jesus. Jesus told us in Matthew 28, that go and make disciples, baptizing them. So the baptismal waters represents, as Romans 6 says, our identification with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So the, the symbol reflects a deeper substance. True with communion. Uh, some people get confused about communion and think that by eating uh, some unleavened bread, cracker, or whatever is being passed, and some wine or juice, that their sins are washed away. They're taking on the literal body of Jesus. And the Bible tells us that communion is a symbol of a deeper substance. Uh, taking communion elements does not redeem us. Drinking wine and eating a cracker will not redeem us. It's that we remember being redeemed by our faith in Christ, whose broken body on the cross, no bones were broken, but he was beaten beyond recognition, and that his blood was shed to pay the penalty for our sin, the symbol of a deeper substance. And the Sabbath is the same way. The Sabbath was given as a symbol to the nations around Israel, Judah, as well as to Judah themselves, that they were trusting in the promises of God completely. That when God says, I want you to take a day off to contemplate, to meditate on my work, to worship me and so forth, to trust me completely, it was a step of faith because that meant one day less in the fields, one day less at the office, and that God would provide for them. And so this idea of rest, and, and the reason why Judah was taken into captivity is because they did not enter into rest. They didn't trust God. They basically said, you know what? Here's God's promises, but I'll tell you, we have other gods. We have a plethora of, of gods around us, and we're going to trust them because they don't, they're not going to make us poor by taking a day off. <laughs> we have many people today in our culture do the same thing. They say, well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in his promises. I mean, they're archaic, they're old, they're out of, they're out of date and so forth. Have you ever heard that before? Or sometimes people say, well, that's your truth, that my truth's different. No, there is the truth. And Jesus, in fact, said he was the way, the truth, and the life. And no one came to the Father except through him. And so in Psalm 23, we have this reminder of rest and the reminder of where the rest comes from. Okay? Uh, rest is a symbol of a deeper substance. So when David writes in Psalm 23, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Psalm 23. Maybe you haven't memorized. I, I haven't memorized as well, but I want to read from the ESV this morning just to make sure that we're all on the same track. Where David writes, the Lord is my, what? Shepherd, I shall not, <laughs> I shall not want. Um, the reality of resting in the shepherd provides rest. And that's a picture of rest. I shall not want. And here's the first principle I want to share with you this morning. Is wherever God guides, God provides. I'll say it again. Wherever God guides, God provides. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And our, I shall not have need of anything is another translation. 
what does God provide? Well, first and foremost, the message about rest. So the good shepherd provides rest. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. There's other passages of scripture that, that tell us our identity. One of the identifying names that God gives us, and one of those names is our sheep. We are sheep. Sheep are not known for self-defense. Sheep are known really to be sometimes kind of uh, weak animals. In fact, we never say, hey, look, don't go out in the forest because there are wild sheep out there. No. Um, sheep, I've heard, uh, actually, you know, if a wolf comes, a sheep would basically roll on its back and say, what do you want, chops or, you know, <laughs> like a leg tonight? What would you like? But David literally says, the Lord is not a shepherd. He says what? The Lord is my shepherd. And when I follow the shepherd, I have everything I need. And when you think of the shepherd's identity, immediately I say, well, who's the shepherd? Well, David says it's the Lord. And we could say here the fullness of the triune Godhead. I mean, the Trinity is not ever separated. When you trust Christ as your Savior and Lord, not only does Jesus come to live inside you, according to the Bible, but the fullness of the Godhead comes to live inside of you. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so wherever he guides, he provides. In fact, I'd like to personify this shepherd a little bit more by saying I believe the shepherd is Jesus himself. In John chapter 10, Jesus said this, I am the good shepherd, right? I think he's referring to Psalm 23. I know my own, I know my sheep, my sheep know me, wherever uh, they hear my voice and they what? Follow me. Um, can you say this morning with complete assurance and complete confidence, the Lord is my shepherd? You see, there's, that's where true rest and that's where true peace comes from. He's not just a shepherd. In order to have the Lord be your shepherd, Every one of us must make a personal decision to trust him. Some say, well, how can I know if Jesus is my shepherd? Well, Jesus said we can know. In John 10, verse 27, he continues to say, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. I mean, we can know Jesus personally and are actively in that relationship, following him in a living, listening and learning relationship with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. One day I was speaking to youth in the country of Indonesia and this young uh, high school girl walked up to me and she said, how do I know that Jesus is real? I said, ask me, tell me again. She goes, well, I think Jesus is kind of like the Easter bunny or maybe like Santa Claus. You wanna believe in this and have this hope in something that's not real. And I said, well, why don't you ask him if he's real? She said, what? I took her back. I said, no, I, I believe that Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. And I believe he's not only with me right now, but he's in me and he's with us. So why don't you ask him if he's real? And she says, well, how do I do that? I said, just bow your head and say something like this. Jesus, if you are real, would you please show yourself to me? Would you please reveal yourself? And in the quietness of that moment, she bowed her head and she prayed that prayer. And then she opened her eyes and said, okay, I know Jesus is real. How do I trust him as my savior and Lord? And I was able to share the gospel with that young lady. And she came to faith. You see, Jesus' sheep hear his voice. And Jesus said this in John 6, uh, 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever trusts in me, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. Have you trusted in Christ? Is he your shepherd? Not simply just your savior, but the one who leads you and guides you. The one who has the direct reins and control of your life. Remember the old uh, bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot. Well, you know, I'd rather have him be my pilot. How about you? How about if I just sit in the chair and let him lead me? Let him guide me. Maybe you're going through some very difficult times this morning. And all of us do. This world is fallen. It's broken. 
And sometimes we get to the place where we think, I wonder, does God really care? And I'm telling you this, Jesus cares for you. He loves you. And he longs for you to come to him with your whole heart and say, Lord, I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand where I'm going, but I wanna surrender my life completely to you as my savior and my shepherd. I want you to guide me. I want you to lead me. And in that commitment, he will provide rest. It's sort of like when the disciples were in the boat and the storm is raging around them, but Jesus is asleep in the boat. Why? Storms don't bother Jesus. Do they bother us? They do. But we have to get our eyes off the storm and get them back on the Savior, get them back on the shepherd. Not only does Jesus provide rest, but he also provides restoration. In verse 3, David writes, he restores my soul. Now, there is a difference between rest and restoration. Do you agree? I mean, if you have a sprained ankle, you rest the ankle, um, but you need to rest it until it's restored. Why? Because if you just rest it and the swelling goes down, you go out and play tennis again, or you play a game of golf and you twist it, guess what? You're going to hurt it worse than you did in the first uh, situation. So, um, Jesus doesn't simply restore sprained ankles and sprained bodies and broken ankles. He restores broken souls and strained relationships. Have you ever been there? I mean, maybe you need to have your soul restored this morning. You know in your heart that the love, the peace, the intimacy that you once had with Christ is gone and you want to have that close walk again. I know what it's like. I've been there too. And simply Jesus is calling us to confess our sin and, and renew that guidance relationship, that leadership place that Jesus must have in our lives to say, Lord, you're large and in charge. Restore me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Restore to me that intimacy, that relationship that we once had. And Jesus said, look, I'll do it. I'll restore it. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Restoration means that I experience his forgiveness. I'm filled with his peace. And now I'm taking steps not only to, to rest in the righteousness that's given to me as a gift, but to live in a godly way. You see, the reason why we need restoration in our lives as, as believers is because sometimes we walk away from the Lord. We're involved in a lifestyle that we know is wrong. We're doing things that we know are wrong, and yet we say, well, you know, I'll let this baby play out. Please, it's never too late to return to Christ, to stop living in sin and live for the Savior. And my encouragement is you do that right now because where he guides, he provides. Point two, where he directs, he protects. Seems kind of similar, but we're talking about provision as well as protection. David says this in verse four, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When Jesus Christ is our shepherd, when we give him the control and the reins of our lives, he enables us to fear less. That's my next point, where, where he guides, he provides, and where he directs, he protects, okay? And when he directs us, David says, he makes me fear less. Now, fear is a good thing. I'm not, I don't want to say that as Christians, you know, it's good to be fearless because the Bible tells us that we should fear God. <laughs> In fact, Jesus said, don't fear him who's able to, to kill the body, but fear the one who's able to cast both body and soul into hell. Fear God. It's an it's a overwhelming thing to fall into the hands of the living God who's holy and without sin. And so some people, you know, they have this flippant idea towards God. But I'll tell you this, we're called to fear God. And fear means to reverentially trust him completely. But when Jesus is my shepherd, where he where he is directing me, he protects me and makes me fear less, okay? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
Now there's a, a debate here. There's a disagreement among some translators as to how to translate this, um, whether it's the valley of the shadow of death or whether it's the valley of the shadow of darkness. Death and darkness are synonymous terms or are the same words in the Hebrew language in some, in some areas. But what are the two things that people fear the most? It's usually the fear of the dark, the fear of death, or the fear of taxes. <laughs> but the fear of death and the fear of darkness, David says, I'm not afraid. It's merely a shadow of the reality. When Jesus is with me, it's merely a shadow. I have nothing to fear because he's my protector. I'll never forget one day I was, um, I worked, ministered in central Phoenix and we had a number of students who came to faith in the barrios, in the projects in South Phoenix. And so I went to visit this young man who became a new believer and I'm walking in my car and there's a group of gang looking guys and they stopped me because I'm the white guy in the Latino African-American neighborhood. And they said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm a pastor and I'm here to see one of the young men who came to faith in Jesus. And they said, you're a pastor? And you're here to help? I said, yes, absolutely. They said, okay, we'll tell you this. It's not safe for you to be here. But if anybody bothers you, just tell them you're with us. We'll protect you. That's kind of interesting, wasn't it? Where God guides, he provides. And sometimes where he, and when he, when he directs, he protects. And sometimes he uses things that we wouldn't recognize as, as protection. But when the shepherd is large and in charge of our lives, we don't have to be overcome by fear. Satan loves to use fear to keep us from following Christ. At the same time we're following Christ, that he is our shepherd, guess what? Satan is not happy and will encounter some trials and difficulties that maybe would not have encountered if we were just simply passively walking in this life. But when we when we intentionally make Jesus our shepherd, Satan is not happy. And the Bible tells Ephesians 6 that he throws temptations our way, that he's like a, a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, literally to ingest. Satan means business. He hates you if you love Jesus. And so I hate him, but I love Jesus. So I know I'm under the protection of my Savior and King Jesus. So if Jesus is my shepherd, I will fear less. No matter what you're going through, no matter what shadow you're under, guess what? Give it to Christ. Whatever storm you're going through, give it to Christ. He'll not only allow us to be to fear less, but he'll also provide us with a fullness. David goes on to say this about this, this um, fullness. In verses four and five, he sets a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Now, we want to go on to realize that you are with me, David writes. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, he provides a full table for us when our enemies are present. And a cup that overflows with his comfort, the anointing of the head with oil symbolizes that point of real and experienced presence during the threats of the enemy. David is at peace in the middle of the dark shadows of death and darkness. And why is that? Because he says, you're with me. Is Jesus with you? Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. He's with me. Men and women, let's not fear the storm because it's in the storm that we learn to hold on to the shepherd. I talked a little bit earlier about a passage in Mark 4, 37 through 39, where Jesus says, hey, we're going to go to the other side. And they're in the middle of the lake and the lake storm hits and waves are crashing. They're going to sink and Jesus is asleep. Why? Because the storms don't bother him. Do they bother you? When I'm safely in the arms of Jesus, guess what? He gives peace and protection in the middle of the storm. The disciples are crying out to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, we're going to die. We're going to die. Don't you care? And Jesus wakes up and he says three words that incredibly just overwhelmed the disciples. And this is what he said. Peace, be still. 
and suddenly the storm stopped. The waves were whooped. The sea was still. Are you in a storm right now? Maybe you're in a storm. Maybe it's a health storm. Maybe it's a financial storm. Maybe it's a family storm. I'm going to share this with you. Jesus can bring peace to your storm. But you have to commit yourself to follow him. Say, Jesus, you're my shepherd. I'm, I'm going to stop trying to lead my life and my own strength and power. I want you in control. So let's review. When the Lord is your shepherd, where he guides, he what? Provides, right? Where he protects, where he directs, he protects. Now we're going to go to our final point. The third thing about the, the, about the only shepherd who gives rest, what he says he will do, both in the past and the present and the future. But let's look at the past and present first. David writes, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Men and women, let me, let me remind you, we belong to a God who cannot lie. David says, when I'm following the Lord as my shepherd, when he's leading me, I am able to be in the present, in the middle of the storm, and then look back on the sea of my life and see how God calmed the storm I just sailed through. I can see the goodness of God. When David says, surely goodness and mercy shall what? Follow me all the days of my life. It's because when you're in the middle of the storm, sometimes we fail to experience the goodness of God. And we doubt his goodness, but then when it's over, we look back, the storm abates, and we see the shepherd being faithful to us, protecting us, guiding us, leading us through the storm. You remember that poem about the, uh, the feet on the seashore, you know, and I said, Lord, I noticed that there was only one set of prints when I was walking through difficulties and I thought you were with me. And Jesus said, yeah, I was with you. I was carrying you. That's why the prints you saw in the sandstorm were mine. I picked you up and I carried you through the storm. So what Jesus says he will do, can you look back in your life and see God's faithfulness? Then whatever you're going through right now, you can rest in the fact that faithful is he who's faithful in the past. He will be faithful right now. He will carry you. He will guide you. He will direct you. He will do what he says he will do. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They follow me. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. One man was going through a very difficult time and he said to the pastor, he's ready to die. He says, pastor, pastor, I'm ready to die and I can't remember any of God's promises. And the pastor said, don't fear my friend. God has never forgotten his promises to you. You may have forgotten them, but God won't forget. I am now 63 years old. I came to know the shepherd when I was a boy, yet I've not always followed him closely, but he's been faithful. I have a wife I've loved for 42 years. I have five children and 10 grandchildren. In all the trials and tears of our lives together, I can tell you this, God's mercy and goodness has followed me all the days of my life. I want to say to each one of you listening this morning, the same testimony can be yours if you make that commitment, if you make that decision to follow the only shepherd who will give you rest. What gives you rest today? You say, well, I have enough in my IRA. Well, um, it's a false shepherd. It be taken away at any moment. We have many shepherds that we follow. Maybe it's a politician. You go, hey, this guy, he's going to make America all that it needs to be made, and we're going to be a phenomenal country, and so forth and so on. So my hope is not built on a politician. My hope is built on nothing less than the Word of God and Christ himself, right? Jesus is going to be faithful in our future. He says, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord, how long? Forever. What's David talking about? Is he talking about one day I'm going to be with Jesus? Or is he talking about um, the day-to-day -day experience of Christ right now? The answer to that question, those questions are yes. Can any of us fathom how incredibly awesome it will be in the future to live in God's house? The Bible says it will be stressless and peaceful. But did you know right now you're seated with Christ in the heavenlies? 
You say, I can't wait to get to heaven. You're with Christ right now in heaven, according to the book of Ephesians. We're with him. He's with us. He's not only with us, he's in us. But guess what, what beloved? We don't have to wait to get to heaven to experience the redeeming rest, peace, presence, and intimacy of our shepherd. Because not only is he with us, he lives inside us if we've invited Christ into our life. That's why he said in John 14, 27, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Don't let your hearts be filled with trouble and do not be afraid. And women, what's filling your fear wagon? Health concerns, maybe relationship concerns, maybe your kids or your grandkids are in trouble. I don't know, but I'll tell you this, when you commit them to the Lord, He'll give you peace. Let him carry the load. Jesus said, take my yoke upon, upon you. Learn of me. The yoke was that thing that they put two oxes in as they plowed the field. And Jesus said, take my yoke upon me, upon you, and, and learn of me. Just follow. That's all you have to do. Jesus will do the, the heavy lifting if we just follow. Men and women, wherever Jesus is, peace is. Peace is not the absence of trouble, but peace is the overwhelming presence of Christ when he is in complete control of our lives. So as we close this morning, I ask this question, who is your shepherd? Is Christ the Lord and master of your life? Can you say with David, the Lord is my shepherd? Why don't you pray that with me right now? Jesus, you are my shepherd. And I'm going through this difficult time, but I'm trusting you. I'm committing it to you. I'm surrendering my problems to you. And I ask you to take them and lead me and guide me. Help me to hear your voice and to follow you. And he will answer that prayer. If you're here with me this morning and you say, you know, I know about Jesus, but I don't know Jesus. Let me tell you something. Just invite him to come in. Invite the living Christ to come in. Do you believe he died for you? Do you believe he died to pay the penalty for your sin? Do you believe he was buried? Do you believe he rose again, that he lives? Listen, salvation is not of works. Salvation is by grace through faith, and all you have to do is by faith, Jesus, I'm trusting you. Come into my life and change me from the inside out. I want to be redeemed. I want to be born again. I receive from you that great gift of forgiveness and salvation and he will do it. All you need call, do is call. May God bless you, may he keep you, may his face shine upon you, and may he give you peace. In his name I pray, amen. God bless you, we'll see you next week.